Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Lena Cashin with the Space Force Association. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. And welcome to all our guardians, to our industry, to our international partners. Thank you so much for coming. Today, we're going to start out the threat briefing with a foundational piece about Russia and China and how they're countering our space capabilities. Um, it's been ver very important, as General Saltzman mentioned in his remarks, space enables our way of life, from banking to telecommunications to weather and uh, remote sensing monitoring. But for our joint force, space provides uh, capability for missile warning, missile tracking to protect our homeland. It also provides us assured communications in areas that are hard to get to and hard to operate in. It provides us position navigation timing for precision targeting. But China and Russia are challenging that. And to give you a brief on that, uh, we have our threat uh, expert, Chief Master Sergeant Ron Lurt, and also Clint Clark from XOA Analytics. So we're providing a space threat brief a little bit different today than normal. It's not just U.S. government, but it's U.S. government partnered with industry. So to present this threat brief is Chief Master Sergeant Ron Lurt and Clint Clark. Thank you. Yeah. See you, General Miller. <laughs> All right, good morning, SFA. You know, Clint and I were joking in the back that uh, based off of the SFA screensaver, we should have had a slide dedicated to a threat brief on the sun. It seems like it's this menacing, looming threat, and based off of what TSO and uh, Simpson just talked about, apparently that was an issue with the Guardian Arena as well. So, sadly, there will not be a threat brief on the sun, at least not in my slide deck. I'll save that for a flip one to cover that when you get to his portion. So, without further ado, we're going to get straight into it. So, this is a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to hit some big uh, top level items, and then I'm going to hand off to Clint, who's going to talk about some of the, the shenanigans, as we call it, that are happening out at the Geo Belt. So before we talk about where we are today and, and the context of why it's significant when we talk about the PLA, uh, we've got to go and rewind the hands of time and look back at 2010. So this is what this particular chart is showing you. This is 2010, and this is what the area of influence looks like for the PLA. It's limited, right? At this point in history, uh, this is pre g the Chinese are more concerned about modernization of their technology and their different systems, like the Navy, like their air defense systems, you name it. And they're doing that, as shown in those bar graphs. They're also concerned about missile technology, and they do have a diverse set of options for that, but they're still working in that. And the real issue underpinning this is they are still reliant on foreign sat nav to be able to do this. And this is something that the Chinese know they want to get after and they want to work at and fix because they want to move past 1996 humiliation that occurred during a Taiwan missile crisis, or Taiwan Strait crisis, I should say, where the Chinese launched three missiles and two of them went completely off course and the Chinese had no idea where they went. They blamed Western GPS as the reason that those missiles were off course. So again, this is sort of giving you an idea of how limited their influence was. And yeah, you got to take into consideration that yes, they are the largest Navy in the Indo-Pacific at this time, but they have no carrier. They don't have the ability to do air-to-air -air refueling with any other bombers. But so much of what they can't do is underpinned by the fact that they don't have the space infrastructure that they want. If you look in the top corner there, you can see sort of the inventory numbers. They've only got 36 satellites at this point, and only a handful of them are their Baidu constellation that they're now starting to get uh, basically operational. So in this pre-G era, they're inward looking, and they're focused on modernization. Now, before I go to the next slide, understand that in three years from this, President Xi takes power. One year later, in 2014, they start to unravel some of the restrictions that they have, and they start allowing private investment into their space sector, which helps explain some of the satellite numbers and the boost that you're going to see. And really, under Z, you see some significant reform that leads to essentially what we have moving into 2025. Significantly more capability. Their area of influence has grown. And if you look at the sort of call-out box that has the numbers, we went from 36 satellites in 2010 to over 1,000 uh, before as we move in 2025. Norm-shattering behaviors have been enabled because of their ability to have space 
and what that's able to offer their capabilities and their forces. Uh, they're breaking the ADAs as an example for Taiwan more regularly and more often. You can see in the graphic there at the top, the Chinese have moved from kill chains to kill webs. And it's because they've now finalized and they have their 60th Baidu satellite or spacecraft on Constellation as of this fall. So they went from no or barely any capability in 2010 to now they have their own Reliant GPS. 60 of them, 24 in Neo, 3 in Geo, and then another 3 in IGSO or in Climb Geo, and then one backup for each individual spacecraft. That gives you your 60 total that they have now. Increasingly assertive, and oh, by the way, we now have to worry about things like Volt Typhoon and Salt Typhoon, which is pretty well out in the press, but their cyber activities are growing significantly at this point as well. So when we talk about where we are with their inventories, again, it's nice to see sort of what that gave the Chinese in terms of total numbers, but this gives you some context as to what their total numbers actually are. So a thousand, over a thousand for the Chinese, as I said earlier. The Russians, unfortunately, about 250. This is a sanctions win story ever since 2014 when they rolled into Crimea and then obviously everything that they've done with Ukraine after that. Sanctions do work, and it's very reflected in terms of what the space capability looks like for the Russians. Now, that being said, while the Chinese are our competing threat, we do respect the fact that the Chinese pose an acute threat. Uh, they've taken some steps, and they understand that there's significant value in space. We've all heard about some of the uh, discussions about a potential nuclear capability that they want to have on orbit one day. And also, we do know that in recent months, the Russians are now looking at very low Earth orbit, so VLEO, to be able to help out with some of their remote sensing needs as they look at their efforts in Ukraine. So I want to talk for a second about the power commercial in these next few slides. The Chinese are very, very good about talking about what they can do in a public domain. And these are some examples. On the left, they publicized a report. They had a, essentially a research paper that talked about how they can see GSAP. They even talk about Silent Barker. And then they even show renderings of what they say GSAP looks like. On the right side of the slide, you essentially see what they have as an overseas naval port. That's all that they call it. But it's a commercial synthetic aperture radar image of an overseas port. If anyone wants to take a stab at where that is, find me in the, in the hallway. But uh, it is a U.S. port. Uh, and you know what? I'll just tell you, it's Norfolk, right? Like, it, it's Norfolk. They just refer to it as an undisclosed overseas naval port. It's good. It really is. The problem is we can do better, and we are better at what we do. So on the left, it's cute and all that the Chinese use renderings of GSAP, but this is Worldview, right, Maxar, looking at one of their own Worldview birds doing near-Earth imaging. A lot better than just a rendering. On the right, you have Capella, synthetic aperture radar shot, and we don't have to hide the fact that we're looking at a naval base. That's Yulin, it's a Chinese naval base. Exquisite capability, good capability. The key takeaway here is when we talk about how we need to exploit what we have, buy what we can, and build what we must, this is buying what we can. This is what's out there, and this commercial capability that's available is what can help us as a service shift our efforts when we talk about the budget and our priorities towards space superiority and the things that don't really have a commercial niche market. So to close things out on my particular portion of this, I just want to highlight some of the space key events for the PRC this year. We're not going to cover uh, each one of these, but I'll just highlight sort of a few of them. In April, the Chinese got rid of the Strategic Support Force this was essentially what provided a uh, bureaucratic oversight, if you would, over their space forces, which is known as the ASF, the Aerospace Forces. They diminished, they dissolved that. Completely got rid of it in April this year, probably because of corruption. But the problem with this is this elevated their space forces to where now they are directly below the CMC, which is their highest decision-making organ within the Genji. So they essentially have that, as we like to say in the military, direct choke on over their space forces that happened as of April of this year. They've accomplished several significant events. You know, you can see there they did a 12-kilometer hop test, so they are chasing reusability. Just recently this week, uh, one of the leaders of one of the premier commercial companies in China mentioned that by the end of the decade, they expect to be, and I quote, seeing SpaceX's taillights, end quote. So in terms of where they are in reusability and what they want to get after for capability, that's where they sort of see themselves and what they want to get after. It's not all good news, though. And this is a sort of a plug for, hey, standards has a, has a place sometimes. Over the summer, uh, you may have seen that the Chinese launched a rocket on accident. Yes, it was on accident. So it turns out when you use a mechanical arm to hold a static rocket in place, and it's only rated for 600 tons of thrust, 
and the rocket that you're firing does over 800 tons of dust, uh, you accidentally launch rockets. And that's what happened with the PRC over the summer. And again, as I sort of hit on earlier, they have completed their BIDO constellation. It's sort of all eyes now looking forward to BIDO 4 and what kind of capabilities that they're going to get with that as they start to look into the research and development of that particular capability. All right, so at this point, I'm going to hand off to the smarter and taller Clint from Expo, and he's going to walk you through some great things here out at GEO. But not better looking. He noticed he left that out. <laughs> Normally, this is the part of the conference where I'll say things are about to get real weird, but uh, you guys made it weird enough, SFA, so appreciate that, so I feel in, I'm in good company here. So, what do I want to talk about? So, it's one thing to see their layout, their, their body count, their order of battle. It's an entirely different thing when you see them operating on orbit, right? So, you had a fifth-year birthday video. Why are we here? Because for the last 10 years, China has been in the domain practicing. And when our senior leaders go out and talk about, hey, 2027, fight is on, I'll tell you what you picture, and I'll tell you what China pictures. Number one, China pictures a fight differently than you. You're picturing a combined arms joint force enabled by our guardians. China pictures you not showing up, and they're actively planning for it. They intend to control your domain, and for 10 years, they've been practicing the techniques you see on this screen. And it's not just that they've been practicing them, they've been doing them in very specific ways with huge delta Vs relative to what we're able to produce. And they're doing them in ways that challenge our kill chain. And you've got to be ready for that. So ordinarily, I do a long form version of this. We show you all these tactics. We don't have time today. We're just going to touch some highlights and I'll show you one thing at the end. They call it a Christmas present, but it happened in October. So it might be the nightmare before Christmas. So I'll show you something fun at the end and I'll try to get off on the clock here. So where do we begin? So first of all, we watch China operate at GEO, and they don't sit here like we do. They're moving around. So the kid's going to get off the stage. We're going to move around. You got to act. Actually... Get real close. They are still not there. Are we, are we got Tom's back? They weren't prepared for a hop off the mic. Well, so what? <laughs> Right here and breathe it like I know. Actually, you got this. Just like that. We'll do this until the other one works. So here's where they are. So what you're seeing on this screen, for those of you who haven't seen it before, satellites that are going straight down, they're at geo. Satellites zigzagging, they're moving up and down above geo. Notice China doesn't sit still. They're all over the sky. Why are they doing this? Because they're coming for you. In their strategy documents, they will tell you whoever controls space controls the earth. And they're operating doctrine documents. You know what they say? Whoever gets space superiority is going to win the fight. That's your job to counter this. And they're practicing stuff all across the sky. So normally when you see these, these technology briefs, we're like, oh, let's talk about their experimental satellites. Their experimental satellites move around. They do a bunch of stuff. A whole bunch of things that they do. They blow up and down the belt. They hold everybody at risk. Periodically, they do crazy stuff. They'll get on top of a satellite. They'll show you how to do some of this to it. And sometimes they'll pick it up and move it away. They're practicing those tactics. And if, like General Kaufman, you don't have any defensive counter space tactics, I can get my hands on you. And I can do what I want. They're practicing it all the time. So we talk about these all the time because they're the scariest. But they just got routine inspector satellites that just walk up and down the belt. What are they doing? Well, I get a good look at you. Got a good look at you. I've got a good look at you. If I've got RF, I've got a good picture of the RF environment coming up and down. If I'm below you, I get to see you this way. Now I come up above. I can look at them from the other side. I can see what they're doing. They're doing these techniques all the time. And it looks like this. When you look up there and you see orange, that's just measurement. When you see white, that is an alert that they have done something unusual, either by themselves or they got a little too close for comfort to something else. Where they can, right? I'm not a collision risk because I'm not moving, but I, I can have military effect on you. And China satellites can have military effect on all of yours. And if you're going to control the domain, you better have a plan for this. Then they've just got their routine geo fleet. Looks like ours. Sits there. I think in this case, I'm showing you missile warning, but I could have shown you SIGINT, could have shown you EOIR, things that give them missile warning, things that give them precision targets on the ground, things that give them moving target indicators. They've got a huge fleet of those. 
you'll notice one of these has a lot of white dots. Why is that? Because they know we have assets up there, and they want to be able to defend themselves. So they're practicing defensive counter space techniques all the time. And we see their tactics. And for those of you in the operating command, you better start practicing against those tactics. Because they're either coming for you, or when you come for them, they're going to have a playbook to run against you to make sure they can still provide space services to their force, over-the-horizon targeting, precision strikes, and we can't. That's the game. All right, let's see. Yeah, one more. All right. So this is your Christmas present. Nobody's seen this before. You may have heard Intel Stat 33E had a really bad day. A really bad day in space is really bad. Never seen something like this at Geo. So what happened? I don't know. But I know it went from one thing to about a thousand things. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. In this case, it's just a commercial object that had some sort of event. It exploded. However, you've never seen what a destructive ASAT at GEO will do to the GEO belt. I'm about to show you what it looks like. Because we see China practicing tactics that look like co-orbital threats and direct ascent threats to GEO. So what I want you all to do to get a sense this is your nightmare before Christmas, look where Intel Sat 33 is in the bottom. I'm going to start a video. You're going to see what the geo population looked like on October the 18th. And then you're going to see what it looked like after. And for those of you that are responsible for dealing with counter, counter space threats, you've got to stop this from happening intentionally. So video's going. Sound effects are appreciated. Not a simulation. It's bad enough that it happened. And, and in, initially there was a lot of debris we had to worry about for a collision. But I'll say this directly to Rock Miller. If that happened and you were planning for it as a bad guy, you could deploy anything you wanted at Geo in the noise that that created, and you're gone. You are hidden, and you can hold everything with the Geo belt at risk. So I'll pause there, give it back to the Chief to wrap up, and we'll take questions if there's time. I think my mic still works. All right, that's it for us. This is our key takeaway slide. I'll make this very brief. You can't spell joint without space. That's pretty much all that this slide is telling you, right? If you don't believe what you heard about the Space Force truth, if you don't believe anything that you saw about what we just talked about, maybe you can take the Army and the Navy's word for it, because those are their operational warfighting concepts. That's the Navy's distributed maritime concept of operations. That's the Army's multi-domain operations concept. Those feed the joint warfighting concept. You might not be able to see it in the back, Folks in the front can see it is riddled with the word space and or the use of satellite. What do you take away from this? Our sister services are under the assumption that space security is there night one. Because if it's not, they cannot employ their capabilities and be part of the joint force. With that, that is all that we've got. I'll kick it over to Clint for one Yeah, I mean, if, you, if there is a question or two, feel free. Clint just went rogue on me with this one, so now I'm terrified because I'm not in a skiff, and this was not pre-rehearsed, but hey. If, if it sounds classified, I'll answer it. Do we have any out there? If you do, just yell it out. We're off the clock. <laughs> if not, we will be roaming. Catch us on break. I believe that's what's coming up next. Perfect. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for your time.